Okay, it's 4 o'clock. I will call the meeting to order, and I feel like Ed Sullivan today. We've got a really big show tonight, and uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, does someone like to move the minutes? Moved, seconded. All those in favor? Contrary, carried. Next meeting, uh, May the 25th, 2022. And the first uh, item on the delegation is, is a delegation. I'd like to invite Tasha Raman and uh, Simran Sarai to uh, present on the year of the Salish Sea. And I believe I see Tasha there. Would you uh, like to uh, make your, oh yeah, and there's Simran. Would you please uh, go ahead with your presentation, please. Yeah, thank you, Harold. Let us just pull up our PowerPoint real quick. So, hi everyone, my name is Simran Sarai and I'm going to be presenting with my colleague Tasha Romain today. We are the co-leads of the year at the Salish Sea Initiative and it's so nice to meet you all. Um, and then we're just going to tell you a little bit about what the year of the Salish Sea is and what we're hoping to hear from you today. Before we begin, we just want to respectfully acknowledge that we're calling in from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. First Nations have been warning us of the harmful impacts that extractive industry and continuous expansion have and will continue to have on our fragile ecosystems. Indigenous communities have been stewarding the lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to carry out incredible stewardship work in and around the Salish Sea. We're continually learning what it means to live on unceded lands and encourage everyone to keep this at the forefront of our work. So in this presentation, we will be going over what the year of the Salish Sea is and why the city of Richmond should proclaim June 8th, 2022 to June 7th, 2023, the year of the Salish Sea. So the year of the Salish Sea initiative is a movement that emerged out of the SSU semester by the Salish Sea cohort in fall 2021. This was a 13 week long interdisciplinary course made up of 12 students from UBC and SSU, and it was hosted by Simon Fraser University's Semester in Dialogue program. Over the course of our semester, we spoke with over 50 experts on the Salish Sea, from biologists, indigenous elders, government officials, and NGO leaders. Um, and we learned that one of the biggest, some of the biggest problems that we're facing our oceans are so complex and interdisciplinary, ocean acidification, ocean warming, pollution, um, so many more. So in response to the state of our ocean, the ecosystem, the extreme weather conditions we face, um, and the fragmented governance of the ocean ecosystem, we came up with the year of the Salish Sea as one way to bring together the work already being done to address these issues. The year of the Salish Sea is going to be running from June 8, 2022 to June 7, 2023. It aims to bring together local First Nations, municipalities, organizations, and individuals in the Salish Sea ecosystem region to strengthen existing efforts working towards a healthy Salish Sea through public engagement and the spreading of stewardship and educational opportunities. So the movement asked local governments to declare the year of the Salish Sea in the region to primarily generate awareness and momentum of ocean stewardship initiatives in their communities. It's also aiming to amplify stewardship and conservation efforts and open opportunities for dialogue and collaboration between the stakeholders that are already doing such incredible work on the Salish Sea ecosystem region. Overall, our goals are to encourage collaboration, coordination of the ongoing stewardship efforts, and to generate public awareness and engagement by highlighting any events and other or opportunities for engagement, such as conferences and resources. Finally, we really hope that this is a chance to open up windows to the public and elected officials for meaningful policy changes in regards to the management of our oceans and watersheds at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. The Year of the Salish Sea is also a really cool initiative because it's aligning with the UN Ocean Decade and the UN Decade on Ecological Restoration. And it's also going to be beginning. It's also going to be beginning on World Oceans Day this year, which is really exciting. I'm now going to pass it off to Tasha, who's going to talk a little bit more about the year of the Salish Sea in Richmond. Thank you so much, Sim. Um, hi everyone. My name is Tasha, and I'm the co-lead for the Year of the Salish Sea. And I'm just going to be finishing the presentation. So the Year of the Salish Sea has already picked up in the bio region. Currently, three local governing bodies have passed a year of the Salish Sea motion, declaring June 8th, 2022 to June 7th, 2023 as the year of the Salish Sea. Um, so these are the city of Vancouver, the town of Gibsons, and the Islands Trust Council. 
now is a great time to join this action and to continue to build and join the momentum. Um, so in the picture on the slide, you can see an excerpt from the City of Vancouver's Year of the Salish Sea Motion. We've also sent in a copy of the draft motion with our um, presentation materials. So you should all be able to access the full draft. If not, um, we'd be happy to send it to you. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna go over why we're recommending that the Year of the Salish Sea be proclaimed in Richmond. Um, so as previously mentioned, the proclamation will help the city of Richmond join the momentum that is already picking up in the city of Vancouver and the town of Gibsons and the Islands Trust Council to create a stronger and wider reach for Salish Sea awareness. Um, advancing the year of the Salish Sea will allow for first the amplification of existing stewardship work and the stewardship work of local First Nations and to encourage um, collaboration between different stewards and um, organizations and individuals working towards better health and management of the Salish Sea. It will also increase public engagement and awareness of the urgency behind protecting this ecosystem and call on members of the public to learn more about it, to find out how they can help, um, to position themselves in all of the work that's already going on, um, and to shift towards living a more ocean-centered way of life through dialogue and art and storytelling and ecological education. Um, engaging the public in Richmond could look like highlighting some of the many events, um, like Borkville Days and the Richmond Maritime Festival and the Steveston Salmon Festival. Um, and of course, we are also hoping that the Year of the Sailor sees an opportunity to open windows for effective and meaningful policy change in ocean governance that will support existing ocean-centered work and improve the health and management of the Salish Sea for generations to come. Of course, there's already so much work being done to protect the Salish Sea and its watersheds here in Richmond. Um, so this could all be given support through the year of the Salish Sea being officially proclaimed. Um, work like the proposed estuarium in Gary Point and getting a coastal zone act or getting front back. And we also know about the recent work being done regarding opening up the dike to allow salmon fry and um, spawning salmon into Terra Nova. So the year of the Salish Sea could really build on all of this activity and open windows for more of this work to be advanced in collaboration with local organizations and stakeholders. And these are some of the reasons we think putting the year of the Salish Sea forward in the city of Richmond would benefit the work of the committee, as well as ongoing land and sea stewardship work all over the Salish Sea region. And um, last slide, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you again um, so much all for having us speak today. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them now, or you can visit our um, website at yearofthesalishsea.ca or send us an email if you have any questions after this. Okay, do we have any questions from committee? I don't see any hands up. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to put forward the motion that they've recommended to us that this, to send this to council. This on page 70. Uh, be it resolved that council support the SFU fall 2021 semester and dialogue cohort, et cetera, et cetera. B, that the Richmond Council directs staff to explore opportunities to collaborate, et cetera, et cetera. C, the Richmond Council directs staff to learn from the lived experiences and knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. And an additional uh, D would be that during the year of the Salish Sea, Richmond Council emphasized projects that provide educational opportunities and benefit the Salish Sea and the adjoining Fraser River estuary. And I'll just explain that if somebody would uh, be prepared to second that, Linda has seconded it. Uh, that particular part of it, we are doing a number of things and it's, I think it's a great opportunity to bring them all forward this year under the context of the Salish Sea and the estuary. Uh, we have the Britannia Shipyard Society opening up the docks uh, to moorage to inv invite tourists that sail the Salish Sea to come into our harbor. Uh, we have on the agenda today, we've got the Eco Walkway that we're going to investigate further if we adopt this. Uh, we've got the Phoenix uh, Netlock building that we're looking at. And uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, the, the, um, at the Estuarium, the Chernova Slough, Scotch Pond. We've got problems, things like LNG at Tilbury and problems like the, the, the loss of Fremp. There's going to be issues this year where people will want to bring controls back to the estuary and, and bring Fremp back. We've got Iona Island where the sewage plant is going ahead finally. And of course, the breaks in the jetty allowing the salmon through. 
And then we've got our festivals that they manage, the Salmon Festival, Birchville Days, and the Maritime Festival. So we have a lot of, of, uh, of projects we're working on and a number of festivals we're working on. And I think we should make this a, a big year for the Salish Sea. Okay, Linda was first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the delegation for the presentation today. I really appreciate the work that you went to, and obviously you've done your homework on Richmond. And uh, yes, I think this fits in quite nicely with some of the work that we're doing already and the opportunity to further that work. A uh, question to you, Mr. Chair, to the delegation. Have you presented to any of the local First Nations in the region? Because I think it would be important to have you know, them uh, involved as well. I answer this if that's okay. So we've communicated with Swayletus, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations because originally we passed this in the city of Vancouver and those were the host nations. Um, and we haven't been able to present to chief and council. We did communicate directly with their environmental stewardship coordinators to try and go through them first and say, hey, like this is the environmental stewardship initiative that we're kind of working on um, and that we want to use to help amplify uh, your work that you've already been doing and that any upcoming work you have and how can we support your work through the year of the Salish Sea. They're all at full capacity right now, so meeting with Chief and Council isn't something that we can do at this time just because they are at full capacity. So what we have done is we've reached out to their environmental stewardship teams and communicate with them and let them know kind of what the initiative is about and then asked how we can support their work directly. Right now, the best way they said for us to support their work is to amplify and share on social media. Um, but the year doesn't kick off till June, so we're going to try and meet with, uh, especially Swayla, Tuzmas, Wim, and Squamish before then. And then with the other Coast Salish nations, because there's so many, um, right now the plan is to just amplify the work on their work too publicly um, and hopefully connect with them Soon. I know we have contacts on the island through Raincoast Conservation um, Fund, and they have really good relationships that they've built, and they do work with the local First Nations on the island, so potentially connecting with those nations. Um, There's so many nations, and they all do such incredible work. So, And same with the NGO, so we can't partner and, and organize events with all of them, but we can amplify as much work as possible. So that's the steps we're taking right now. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, Bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, you uh, I'm happy and thank you for coming forward. Uh, uh, great presentation and um, a lot of work has been going into it and uh, it reminds us to uh, uh, get back to where we once were. Uh, Harold uh, will do this and I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Chairman uh, to expand. I believe it's your D. Um, as you know, um, at one time we had Fremp at one time, we had various organizations uh, to protect the Fraser River. And I guess without a, um, a healthy river, we're not going to have a healthy sea. So I guess uh, I, I'd like to see something in there with regard to um, uh, reconstituting or revising or uh, reestablishing the groups that looked after the Fraser River in some way, shape, or form to bring awareness to the river as well. Uh, as to the sea, because I believe they go literally hand in glove. Uh, uh, and I, I think that uh, there may be an opportunity, um, um, as you were alluding to earlier, with a number of issues uh, that uh, uh, we could uh, put them uh, forward as well. And I think they would fit in quite nicely. And I think uh, the work that's already been done by this group just to add um, uh, to that, uh, not only the sea, uh, but uh, uh, where the sea gets its, uh, its source. And um, I think too often we have neglected uh, that, um, you know, one of our big brothers has been, uh, you know, the, the Vancouver Harbor Authority and a few other uh, bigger uh, bodies, but they have tended to uh, neglect um, everything from uh, uh, the environment of the, uh, the river um, right down to the sea. So I'm not sure where that fits in. I uh, take your guidance, um, uh, but I think the Fraser River, uh, not just the estuary, but also uh, the river directly should be uh, mentioned. Okay, I think it works in with D. I, I, I'm just working on uh, what you okay. said, that during the year of the Salish Sea, Richmond Council emphasized projects that provide educational opportunities, 
and, and benefit the CLEC and adjoining Fraser River estuary, and that we work to establish print or other means of protecting the Fraser River estuary. I think that would do it. A reestablished front and, and other groups that uh, other took group. uh, stewardship yeah. of the river in past that have no longer been um, active and have been actually disbanded by other groups other than ourselves. And I think we should be asking, and I should think we should be asking the province to, to do that as well. Okay, yeah, exactly. thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Michael. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, through the chair, a couple questions and comments. Um, are there any of the 12 cohort uh, students who are currently living in Richmond? I don't believe so. Tasha, am I missing anyone? Yeah, I'm not sure about Richmond. I think okay. mostly Vancouver and... Vancouver, Port Moody, Coquitlam, Surrey, Burnaby. Um, but I know most of us are in and out of Richmond quite often. Okay, great. It, it's good to know that you're the co-lead, so we can, you can be kind of the point for people then for, for that um, going forward. Um, is there any um, date or event early in this year of the Salish Sea that you're currently working on? getting collaboration yeah. between all the groups? Um, yeah, so we are planning a June weekend, the weekend of um, June 11th, because um, World Oceans Day, like when the year of the sea starts, is a weekday, so we're planning for the weekend, um, probably June 11th, to be our kickoff, and we're actually planning that with um, the city of Vancouver, and so that's one of the points of collaboration that um, is sort of happening with that municipality, um, and that's, I think, all we have for our kickoff events. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just added all the social media links that were in this document uh, to my own last night and looked through the website. And uh, I'm a regular uh, follower or, or um, advocate for, like, U United Nations decades and years and days. I'm a high school teacher in science, so I often uh, bring that into relevancy. Um, last uh, question I have is, um, is Bob Turner at all involved in, in your group? Bob Turner, he makes the most amazing... Uh, YouTube videos of the Salish Sea, and there's one called Why is the Salish Sea So Rich with Life? And it just came out in January. Was he one of the contacts for your program? He wasn't one of our contacts, but it's actually really funny because we started to link up with other students after our program ended. So one of the student groups was at Kaplan University, and she wanted to link us with him. She sent us his videos and was like, you should check these out. And so we are planning on linking with him through the CAPU students, but it's been tough because end of semester, so they've been been taking a while to get in contact again. Great, thanks. And my final question um, uh, is related to the, your your program. So, will you like how long does your program run till? I, I know you mentioned it was the tw uh, 2021 cohort. So, is this now like you're running a nonprofit going forward, or? Um, yeah. So the semester was um, called Semester by the Salish Sea, which was just September to December 2021. And so the cohort of tw the 12 of us, um, we've completed that program. And so it's me, Semarin, and we have a couple um, cohort members that are helping out on like a bit of a more part-time volunteer basis, but it's, it's me, Semarin, and then our third colleague, um, Emma, who have been sort of taking this on beyond the semester. So it's not uh, part of SFU's program anymore. Great, thanks. Uh, so just a, a comment then. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, the, the presentation and, and uh, Councillor Steve's making the motion uh, that uh, has some, some Richmond-specific uh, language in it and connections to some of the great projects we're doing. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say one of the most magical things about living in Richmond uh, is when I do a little a boat trip all the way around Richmond in my nine-foot boat, and I stop and just float in, in the Salish mm -hmm. Sea because you have to go out. You have to go out so far past the to get out past the the sturgeon banks. Otherwise, you run aground all the time. Um, but anyway, going out there, it's just so magical. Um, and and there's so much work that needs to be done. Uh, like I I can throw a line off and, and bring up more. I'll I'll bring up more garbage than, than I will get uh, fish biting. Um, and it's amazing how much the ground out there must just be littered with it. So, and floating styrofoam that's out there. We need we need to work better. And uh, I really appreciate the effort that you put in, and, and we'll wholeheartedly uh, support this uh, year ahead. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any further discussion? 
All, all those in favor of the motion, including uh, Bill's amendment, all those in favor, contrary, carried. And thank you, once again, thank you very much for your presentation. We're honored. Okay. Next item on the agenda. <laughs> The agricultural non-farm use application by the City of Richmond for the Garden City Lands Community Farm and Conservation Board and Garden City Road. And Jason and, and Alex. Good afternoon and thank you. I have nothing further to add and I'm available to answer any and all questions. <laughs> okay, I do. Is that with Bill? No, sorry, that was last time done. I'm supporting the report. Okay, Michael. Michael. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, well, I do have some questions. Um, so I'll start with uh, on page 10 and 11 of our, of our package. Um, there's a few different uh, items that are the last line says that staff will report back to council on the proposed final layout, uh, fill in the blank, uh, prior to construction. So there's a couple that don't say that, and so I wanted to just ask, um, is the pedestrian level lighting one of those things that will be reported back? Or if this is approved and the ALC approves it, then does it go ahead without any further council consideration? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, we, when we conducted the staff workshop with council in November 2021, we heard specific feedback, which was reflected in the, uh, in the report. That feedback w was specifically um, directed towards the parking, as well as raised boardwalks in the park. We, have al we also heard back regarding pedestrian level lighting. Right. Just, uh, to so pull back, just to pull back just uh, for a moment, the intent of the, the application to the ALC is for approval of the entire park development plan, the entire packet. At key points, staff will come back to council for approval of, for site sensitive uh, design interventions such as parking and the boardwalk. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, my my other, I was just thinking there might be some innovative solutions instead of digging up and putting electrical lines for ground level. I know we have the street lights that go over four roads, and maybe they could be replaced or have an attachment that goes to the west as well. There's already electricity running to them, and then they can shoot light down on the trail and, and then be functional um, in that way as opposed to having to dig up and put more, more pipes and stuff in the Garden City Lands. Um, my next one was about, well, the lookout tower says that it'll be reported back uh, to, to council about the location and, and all that. Um, that's good. Um, the wood board walks, like you mentioned, um, I, I do have some concern that, that they're not going into the most significant, environmental significant areas, just so we can say we'll do habitat co compensation later somewhere else. I'm, I'm really concerned about that, um, that, uh, well, there's so few areas that are really exceptional and we're not doing anything to actually, well, we're doing a few things to restore them and enhance them. But I, I, I was hoping that, that there'd be uh, more dedication in, the, in this um, package rather than signage and site ecology and interpretation in the center, um, but like the actual ways we're gonna be bringing some of the, the health of the peat soils and sagna moss back, uh, which uh, I didn't see it in here. Um, the next one I wanted to speak on is uh, item uh, or on, on our page 12. Uh, it relates to the bridge structure. Um, so uh, can you just say, I don't remember hearing about that before. So is that just for improved access to the Kwantlen site? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, that is indeed the case. Um, we are on the park development plan. It's shown that there's a canal the linear canal along the south edge of the KPU farm fields. And in order to maintain access uh, throughout the site with a farm, uh, with a farm road, a bridge uh, or culvert would be required to um, carry that road across the canal. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next uh, question kind of relates to, uh, well, on, on page 12, um, I'll, I'll state it now. I'm, I'm not um, uh, I, I'm not happy with uh, put, uh, at this time putting it, it in for, um, because it seems like it will be a made, done, done deal if the ALC approves this, to put in the, the parallel lay-by parking stalls along number four road. Um, I, I, I support the parking in the other two sites, but not along four road. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of potted plants that are about to go in and all these great native species. And then to cover some of that space with, for parking and also the traffic stalling to go in and then come out onto this busy road. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I can't support um, put, putting that parking stall network on four road. Um, I'm also very concerned with the uh, two washroom facilities. Uh, I'm all for public washrooms. I think we need more of them. Um, but I, I don't think we need to put them, um, or the second one, on the part near May Drive and Alder Bridge Way. I think we can have the main washroom that's centrally located at the center or, or around there. And then when we need more facilities for events, we bring in uh, the mobile porta potties. And if we need a, another uh, washroom facility, I think we put it across Alder Bridge Way so we don't, again, take up more of the limited garden city lands with pipes and drainage and have to consider sewage and, and all this other stuff. So those two parts of mine I have concern over. Um, the uh, Just a couple more here, if I may, through the chair. Um, this, again, the site ecology and interpretation. Uh, I was just doing a, a thought experiment with my students in 2050, and I, I have a feeling that there might be a sign that says there was once a healthy bog here at that interpretation center because I, th I think we, we really need to get on with um, the stagnant recovery. Um, and then my last question, uh, if I may, the chair is, um, it, it mentions um, Mr. McTavish or equally qualified well, um, qualified environmental professional. Um, could we have um, budget consideration for the next, for the new year to have a staff, a person on staff be that qualified environmental pro professional as opposed to contracting it out to a, a person who does, has no real stake in, in, in Richmond? And, um, and I think if they were on staff, they'd be able to be more uh, in close contact uh, be able to be on site as opposed to competing with other projects they're working on. So that's a question I have to staff. Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, I need to report back on that and uh, get additional information. But I will note that um, to date we've used th third party qualified environmental professionals to uh, ensure independent and um, professional review of our projects so that, there, that we can bring in new points of view as well as um, you know, best practices from industry. No, I think, thank you, I look forward to uh, any further information on, on budgeting considerations because the last few years sometimes there's been, and if you have budget uh, approval for these extra positions, I, I, I'd like um, that to be a, a consideration in the next round. Um, but anyhow, I'll let others speak and see where this goes. Thanks. Jack. Okay, I have uh, basically two questions. The first one is about the parking lots. Yeah, I understand that uh, we need to have a space for parking. However, you know how much space are we talking about? So in terms of the number of cars, are we talking about hundreds? Through the chair to Councillor Al, uh, by no means are we uh, intending to pave uh, pave the Garden City lands excessively. We we I would say that the, I don't have specific numbers at this time, but we are not uh, proposing parking for hundreds of cars. Um, we do recognize that uh, any parking lot design would be um, limited to as the, the focus of the park. Is for as green space. Okay, good. Very good. Yeah, uh, through the chair to Councillor Al, and <clears throat> kind of to follow up with some of Councillor Wolf's questions as well. 
all these items are very conceptual at this stage, as we've discussed with you earlier, and all these items will have to come back for further review. They're on the list to take forward to the ALC to make them aware that these are all attributes and key components for the overarching concept and future of the park. But those finite details are yet to be resolved and will still have to come before you for, for review. Okay, very good. Now, my second question is related to uh, uh, page 17. The in intensive market gardens. Um, if, if my memory is correct, I think this is the first time I, I see this term. So can staff explain to me, um, so what, what is an intensive market garden? Through the chair to Councillor Al, um, intensive market gardens are area uh, larger garden plots that would be made available to, for example, uh, KPU students who would have graduated from the uh, farm program that KPU is operating on the Garden City lands in order to enhance their skills that they learned in school in the previous four-year program. Um, intensive market gardens are, uh, as the, the first word indicates, a very high density uh, uh, production. Uh, and for throughout the entire year or as, as long as possible and may involve, but not necessarily, um, hoop houses, uh, such as what the KPU has installed. On, on their portion of the site. Um, and the, the, the intent is to support uh, young farmers mm -hmm. uh, with developing their skills as well as building up their capital. Okay, good, yeah. The, 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 I, I guess that is what it means. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Linda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you to staff, well, thank you very much for the report, and it's uh, exciting to see some of these projects inch a little bit closer. Uh, it's been a long time since we had the original visioning session, so it's really good to see it moving along. And on that point, uh, what do you think the uh, approval process would be with the ALC? Do we have any idea? I know we've been working with them closely. Uh, through the chair to Councillor McPhail, um, I don't know a specific timeline, but based on past experience, and, as well as taking into account the complexity of the application, uh, I would anticipate that we would receive, uh, I hope, positive determination by the end of the year. All right, that's great. Now, I um, have a question about parking as well. Uh, since the article about this has been in the newspaper, I've had a couple of people contact me with concerns about parking on number four road. I know uh, in the report it talks about 64 spots for the barn structure. How many spots are we looking at on number four road? I know you said it's conceptual, but you know people are concerned because number four road is a very busy road. Um. Through the chair to Councillor McPhail, um, I'd have to get back to you on the specific number, but I believe there are five uh, parking pockets, and um, the the you know we would certainly review the design with transportation, and and as Todd had indicated earlier, um, when we come to that point in the project, we will come with the conceptual design to Council. Um, with that is for your approval before we proceed with any further design and construction. And how many accessible parking spots are we thinking of? Are you working with the uh, Richmond Center for Disability on this? Yeah, through the chair to Councillor McPhail, um, we will meet or exceed all requirements for universal access parking spots. Well, that's great. Thank you. I just have a couple more. Um, Well, maybe that was it. No, Grant, now that we're starting to see a little bit more of our plans evolve, are there opportunity for uh, application for grants? Through the chair to Councillor McPhail, um, certainly the city staff are always uh, 
you know, taking uh, advantage of and looking at opportunities for grant uh, applications. Uh, as you may recall, we recently, for example, secured a grant from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to uh, do, conduct the soil study and, and uh, similar grants of that vein and nature uh, would be pursued by staff as opportunities arise. That's fantastic. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got a, a few comments and questions myself. I just want to say I agree with uh, all the comments that Michael made at the beginning, but I'll stress a couple. Uh, I don't like parking at all. Uh, I think this would be nice to have a park in the middle of the center where just people walk there, and if you wanted to get there, you had to take a bus. But uh, uh, maybe we're not there yet, but uh, it seems to be we spend a lot of time destroying land for those parking lots. Uh, that said, uh, I would like staff to investigate the uh, the Walmart uh, uh uh, parking lot. My recollection is that that parking lot was built to serve a park that was across the street that we no longer have. We we, we took the park, the, the land that was going to be a park on the uh, north side of Alder Ridge Way, and we used that money to buy the Garden City lands. But my recollection is that the uh, parking structure there was supposed to service that park. And if that's the case, then why are we building a park on our side of the street? We'd better to, it'd be better to simply put a, a, a walkway, uh, an overpass, and keep uh, and have people park there. And that said, as well as I'm a bit concerned about putting a washroom there as well. Is, is why would we put a washroom there for the for the cars? It should be at the at the center of the eco center, and and not a washroom in the parking lot. Uh, so those are my uh, concerns about the parking. The other question I have is why not. I simply have parking on number four road on weekends only, so it doesn't create that much of a problem. Uh, I think that the, the activities, we, we have all our activities on weekends, um, farmers markets on weekends, and uh, we can use the, uh, uh, beside the road for parking at that time and leave the highways free. So those are my comments on parking. The main thing I want to talk about, however, is I raised this the last time we issued, and I know it's not part of the report, of the study, but it should be, is why are we having two eco centers within a kilometer of each other? And I think we need a, maybe a referral to staff because I made these comments before and it's not in here. Uh, should we maintain the Nature Park uh, eco center or should we close it down and combine it with this one? I'm concerned in having double staff. We have staff at the, at the Garden City Lands and we have staff um, a, a kilometer away on the Nature Park. And my preference would be to close the Nature Park Center down, uh, use the uh, Nature Park buildings for organizations. It is mentioned in here on page 13 that bog conservation groups might use the Eco Center on the Garden City lands. But we've got an Eco Center that bog conservation groups can use, and, and one is actually an empty building that is for meetings, uh, and, and the other buildings there that they could use for meetings, and put our, all of our staffing on one site. We would put a trail from the Garden City lands to the uh, Nature Park uh, site so people could park there and walk, which would give us another parking lot, and combine the two sites together. And in addition to that, make application to the Canadian government to sell us the south half of the national defense land. So we would actually be able to combine the Garden City lands and the Nature Park lands with uh, together with a piece of land in 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 between, and I think that would that would certainly help. I just really have a problem with having two groups of staff people within within a kilometer of each other doing the same thing. And um, I I I I think we should have a, a an eco center here, but I question having two of them. So I think that's my major concern. I don't know if staff want to comment that, on that now or not, but that's certainly a concern that I have. Any comments on it from staff? None yet. Okay. Uh, Councillor uh, Steve, certainly I'll just make a brief comment. Um, and yes, we, we have heard you make that comment or similar comments previously and continue to look at it uh, in terms of efficiencies in operations and also serving the public more broadly. And, and again, we're, we're back to this comment that this is a conceptual plan and, and as we get into operations the same way, same way we might do when we build a new community center, we think about what the impact is on all the other community centers in the city and, and how we operate them and we would certainly do that as we 
move closer to implementation of this plan. Um, and, uh, yes, you know, I think at different times creating that connection between this site and the nature park has, has been talked about and is a, a great opportunity for the city in the future. Okay, thank you. And I have one, uh, one for, or two further comments. Uh, Michael mentioned the, there's nothing in this plan regarding the, the bog and bog rehabilitation, and that's, and I'm concerned about that. I think we need to the report that or how we're going to do it. Also, I'm concerned about maintaining the water table. I've seen, not seen no uh, results of how we're going to keep the water table up in the bog. It should be 14 inches from the surface almost all year round. Well, at, the bog used to have water at the surface in the winter and then down a foot in the summer. And, uh, and to maintain a sphagnum bog, you've got to have a high water table. And finally, uh, 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 Michael asked the question about uh, consultants, and this has bugged me for years in all departments. It's my opinion we should be using our, 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 our own staff as our consultants. And I just want to point out that Alex is a, is a, is a qualified professional to, to make these recommendations, and he's been doing a great job so far. And I don't see, don't see why we aren't uh, using his, his abilities to, to, to uh, give us that advice. We didn't have agricultural professionals, professionals on staff before. We do now. And, and he's doing great work, Alex, and, and don't blush. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's been bugging me for years, and I'm so happy that he's here doing these things, and why don't we use him, use him more? Now, this is a very personal comment, but that's what we should be doing in all departments. And Bill's got his hand up again. Yeah, we'll double his pay to Harold. Okay, no problem. I agree with you on that. Uh, just a, a couple of, of comments, and there's stimulated a couple of... I'm, I'm quite happy with what we've got. Um, I suggest we... We uh, take the whole report and send it to the ALC um, just to let them know the volume and, and the, the spread of what we're trying to do there and get the concepts through because you never know how they're going to react. Uh, we like to think that they're um, uh, going to rubber stamp things or, or maybe even throw things out, but I think we should do that. We can modify things after. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick question, uh, and I, Harold, um, with the D&D lens, did I not make a, a referral either in the last term uh, for us to buy the D&D lens because it is declared surplus uh, by the Departments of Defense and it's declared surplus by the Department of Transportation? I mean, they are trying to, I don't know when they're going to get rid of it, but don't we have a, a, a staff should check on that, please. Uh, if we don't have an ongoing referral uh, that we are con considering buying to all 20 acres, not just, and I agree with you, Harold, any portion of it I'll take, uh, but we should be, uh, that should be Richmond's. And we've been, we've been having that since 1970s when we wanted to put sports fields over that way. So it's, it's not new uh, on it. Uh, I, just a question on, and I agree with you on um, uh, the parking. Uh, what's there now is sort of like a little drop-off center. Uh, why can we not have communal equipment that would be used there for anybody the gardening and uh, for the, um, uh, the community gardens? Um, and, you know, people check it in, check it out, uh, et cetera. Uh, and d they don't need a place to park there. I'd like to know why Quantlin College is not letting us use their parking lot if you physically go over there, and Harold, this uh, was stimulated, if you walk from the parkade at Walmart to where we'd have the community gardens, et cetera, if you walk from Lansdowne parking lot or Quantlin parking lot, it's a similar distance, okay? If not shorter, it's not a long walk. As a matter of fact, it's a good walk. And we could uh, do a traffic installation there which would be a lot cheaper than taking up land for parking and blacktopping where you can't use it. And why isn't Quantlin on a weekend, a Saturday, Sunday, donating 50 parking lot stalls to us so people can park there uh, without charge and go there? Heaven forbid we're giving them a farm. Did we not, you know, hello, in brotherly love today in 2022, uh, we share, okay? We give you educational opportunities for your students. Let us use uh, your parking um, um, on it. It could be for the community garden people. I have a little sticker or decal or whatever, and they're easy enough to run off. So I think that that should be looked at, and it would solve Harold, not even parking 
on, on the lands whatsoever. And we can use the, the parking lot for something else. Soon as you install parking on the lands, there will never be enough. enough. There will be wanting to do more and more because how come you can park there, but I can't, and I got to go somewhere else? You know the old story. So anyhow, it's something that we should consider. Not part of the report, good report. I'm going to support sending it all there and hopefully get the concepts all uh, approved. Uh, but I think some of the internal things we can uh, dicker back and forth after on it. But I think we have three, air, three parking lots that are huge. It's just a matter of us having an opportunity to use them. Yes, we can use number four road. I have no problem uh, with that. Maybe we don't even uh, need that, but that would be parallel parking there. So, anyhow, and I think uh, when you go to the Garden City lines, you, look, you go to the park, you look like you need to some exercise to get to the park. So, walking 50 meters or 100 meters sure isn't going to hurt anybody. And if I got to carry my shovel with me and my backpack, I think I'm okay. Okay, we talk about okay, kids. Kids going to I school. So I leave that with you. Okay, I assume you're moving the motion, and I hope I'm moving it. Note of that. I, I'm yeah, moving it. I take note of that uh, motion, uh, that suggestion on Quantlin as well. Great idea. Uh, Linda, second it. Any discussion or further discussion? All those. Oh, Michael. I can't hear you, Michael. Your your sound's off. Uh, sorry, um, I, I'm just still hesitating on. Approving it at this stage with the, the language of the parking and the secondary washroom. Um, could, could staff just comment, would we not have a better chance of getting this approved from the ALC if we had less parking and less washroom infrastructure and more space for agriculture? It, doesn't it, isn't the trade-off more likely to get approved? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, I think at this time we would like to be consistent with the messaging that we've had with the ALC uh, over the years and to have the entire park development plan approved by the, uh, by the Agricultural Land Commission, thus giving the city the option that we have the full project mm -hmm. approved and then at key points we come back to council uh, where site sensitive design uh, decisions need to be made. We, 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 we have a discussion and then we receive your approval and, and direction on where to take that design. Staff have heard the, uh, all the comments today and have duly noted the, the, the issues and concerns with regards to parking, lighting, locating uh, of, of washrooms on the site and other uh, Concerns. Through the chair, then, oh, sorry, through, oh. through the chair, Councillor Wolf, if I can also add, um, you know, we have been uh, in front of the ALC, I think, with half a dozen um, applications, successful applications to date. Uh, they are aware of the, the longer scope of the project. And through consultation with them, you know, it was uh, a joint uh, endeavor to bring forward this overarching concept for them. So they're aware of, of where this is going and through those discussions, they're also the ones that are recommending that we come forward with the overarching plan. And I assume okay. if, if they have the, have the same concerns that some of us have about the market, mm -hmm. they'll probably tell you so. So mm -hmm. see what happens. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, uh, just one final comment then is like we heard from um, Councillor Steve, McPhail, McNulty and myself, all members of this committee. And uh, I, I just have a concern that, in the, uh, at a future date, when the four of us who see the, it, the issue or other solutions of parking aren't on this committee, that it might just be go ahead because, hey, the ALC allowed us to do it, and it was in our plan then, so let's do it. Um, so I, I just feel uh, – that's why I'm so hesitant here and maybe a little bit abrupt with uh, comments on this item. But uh, uh, I'll support it with expertise uh, around the table, and I'll just have to keep uh, close watch of it. Thanks. That's the idea. Okay, all those in favor? Contrary, carried. Okay, next item is, and we're going to find my agenda, uh, the Museum and Heritage Service of the Year Review. Another great report. Oh, what a day. To the chair, I have nothing for the, the report, but we do have a highlight video to show to committee today. 
show us that and uh, probably need to show it to council too. Twenty twenty one was a positive year of rebuilding from the low point of the COVID nineteen pandemic. The London Farmhouse was reopened for summer for the first time since 2019, offering tours and gift shop services. The Steveston Tram was reopened in September, welcoming back families and children to refreshed displays illustrating the fascinating stories of the people who rode the tram. While hours at Britannia shipyards remained reduced, popular new initiatives like a children's activity guide and food truck provided opportunities for visitors to safely engage with the site and each other. A highlight for Britannia shipyards was the introduction of a boat tour on the Fraser River. The Gikumi Heritage Boat took passengers on a relaxing three-hour tour up the river providing historical information along the way. The Richmond Museum introduced a new walking tour of Sea Island to complement the two tours created in 2020. This self-guided experience offers participants a glimpse of the fascinating past of Burkeville and the airport. 2021 was again a year of interesting events with delivery adjusted to suit the pandemic conditions. Some events like the London Heritage Farm Society's plant sale and the Gulf of Georgia Cannery Society's haunted sea looked similar to past years. Doors Open Richmond was again an online experience with 35 sites contributing more than 225 virtual experiences delivered through social media using the hashtag Doors Open Richmond. This content had over 160,000 views, making it one of the most experienced years in the history of the event. Richmond Maritime Festival brought opportunities for people to explore maritime heritage both online and in person at Britannia Shipyard. Highlights included the introduction of heritage actors telling the stories of Britannia and 10 unique maritime vessels moored at the Britannia Dock. In December, the heritage sites helped activate Steveston as part of Winter in the Village, Beautiful light displays brought the sights to life, while programming created opportunities for locals and visitors to get in the holiday spirit. Community members also enjoyed the Steveston Historical Society's annual Songs in the Snow performance online. A number of new exhibits opened in 2021. The Richmond Museum's feature exhibit, Reinventing Richmond, explores how the city's identity has changed over time. Interactive elements invited visitors to play Chutes and Ladders, Richmond style, brainstorm city slogans, and design neighborhood flags. The Gulf of Georgia Canneries feature exhibit, Waves of Innovation, Stories from the West Coast, showcases how many important innovations in the fishing industry impacted the people involved in both negative and positive ways. At Britannia Shipyards, the Richmond Boat Builders Building reopened with intriguing displays illustrating boat building techniques and telling the story of Japanese boat building in Steveston. Heritage conservation work continued throughout the year. A major construction project at London Farm restored the building envelope, giving the house a needed facelift. The city's artifacts collections team worked with the London Heritage Farm Society to complete a review of the society's collection. This work will help inform future displays at the site and ensure that important artifacts are well cared for. The year also continued much of the planning begun in 2020. The London Farm Master Plan and Steveston Museum Visitor Experience Plan, developed in collaboration with society partners, were completed and approved by council. Finally, 2021 was marked by the tragic announcement of a number of unmarked graves of school children at former residential school sites across the country. To honor the children found at the Kamloops Residential School, the Richmond community created a memorial in the Cultural Center Plaza. Staff supported this effort by working with community members and Musqueam elders to ensure the items left in memory of the lost children were properly cared for, including saving some for future display. Although it was another unusual pandemic year, museums and heritage sites across Richmond accomplished important work connecting residents and visitors with Richmond's rich history and heritage and preserved important places and objects 
for future generations. Good job. Okay. Any, any further comments? Um, we got some questions. Uh, Alex, uh, pardon me, Alex. Jack. Okay. I just want to ask a question on, on, on the page 39 um, about the artifacts collected or donated uh, in 2021. Now, I want to know uh, do we have a kind of a catalog? of the artifacts that we have so that people can make reference to them or, you know, uh, they may be interested in, in um, viewing or using them for some uh, display or educational purpose. So do we have a, a catalog of some kind that people can search? Uh, through the Charity Counselor Al, we have an online database. So we have a database uh, of all of the artifacts that are in the city's collection, which is accessible online and searchable by the public. And we do often have requests for loans from our collection to be used uh, by other museums or community members and exhibits as, uh, as is allowed by our <coughs> collection policy. Good, thank you. Michael. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, through the Chair. Just a comment, couple of comments uh, to staff and then a question. Yeah, I really valued the, the tour on the Gikumi uh, heritage boat and being able to ch chat with the captain and see the, the whole boat, uh, the whole works of it. Uh, and also with the interpreter, did such a great job. I saw a photo of her uh, speaking with some, some guests on, a, on a, another tour. Um, yeah, it was just fascinating history that I hadn't heard before about some of the South Arm um, sites and, and historical uses. Um, the other one I wanted to comment on was uh, Maritime Festival, which I thought was such a great event. Uh, I went with the whole family and everyone, including a two-year-old, really enjoyed it. Um, and again, interacting with uh, the people at, at the docks were great. Um, my question, though, relates to the heritage conservation um, section. It was on our page 39 at the top. Um, it talks about London Farm heritage conservation and the artifact collections that were just mentioned. Um, I'd like to ask specifically about the boats uh, the, that are uh, not in the water anymore, that are around Britannia, uh, the shipyard uh, area, that are on kind of display, and in a way on display, um, but also are deteriorating fairly quick. I've heard that the one that's in the plastic wrap is just molding away because the moisture can't get out. Um, wh where, are, where are we at for the uh, heritage conservation of those boats? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, we, we've got a number of different plans that are underway that relate to the conservation of those boats. Uh, one of the first pieces is the, is the Steveson Heritage Interpretive Framework, which Council has seen uh, and is being discussed with community as we speak. Um, that will lead a lot of future work. Uh, another piece that is underway is looking at a park plan for Britannia shipyards to see what spaces we have available for proper boat display, uh, as well as, um, you know, uh, structures or other materials that we will need to ensure that the boats are well protected from the elements. Okay, that's great to hear that work is ongoing. Thanks. Am I on, Harold? Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for a great report, great video. I, uh, I can't do much to improvement, but I'd like to offer one suggestion for improvement. And it, it, uh, I think it's something, I think we do a, an adequate job or even a good job, but I think we can do a better job. Uh, and that is in terms of signage and interpretation signage. For example, the Stevenson Museum and Post Office. If you look from um, the east to uh, the museum, you'd never know it was a museum. There's something indelible in, in terms of glass, you can't see it. If I go in the post office, I didn't know there's a museum in the back. And I think we, I don't want overkill, but I think we've got to have effective um, uh, thing. I was sitting, um, talking to two uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, Canadians yesterday um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the post office and uh, 
you know, they, they came and they say, well, what's this? And they asked about the vault, et cetera, and what's in the back, et cetera, and didn't know that. I, and, and I think anywhere else we have it, I think uh, we need to um, uh, look at our signage. Uh, we want to, to uh, enhance tourism. We want to uh, be proud of what we've got. And I'm not saying we're doing a bad job, but I'd like us to try to go one step further. And maybe it's color. I don't know. I'm not a, I don't have any crayons, uh, whatever. Maybe it's uh, the shape of the sign, maybe whatever. But I leave that to you as experts uh, in all the areas, um, um, uh, uh, putting signs up um, where we have it, whether it be. Uh, and then I kind of look at it is what kind of signage is out there when the facility is closed? For example, at the tram. If I come around the tram and it's closed for the day or whatever, uh, and I'm looking, what do I get and what experience do I get when I leave? If I go to the uh, museum or the post office, what do I get when I leave? Do I know that is so that I, can I want to come back? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. I want to come back and visit if uh, or whatever, and if eventually uh, uh, we have it. It's the same, no disrespect, with the London farm. You're driving down the road, it's extremely busy. Uh, you almost get into an accident there because the parking lot is very close and people don't follow the, the 20 k, uh, km um, along, but I, I'll miss the London Farm sign, so to speak, um, on it. Um, if I'm walking, I'll pick it up possibly, but, um, so that I'll go and park, etc. As I say, it's not a criticism. It's can we do better, and I just leave that near Ballywick um, under advisement, but I'd like it recorded that can we do better. Thank you. But, through the chair to Councillor McNulty, we, we actually have um, funding and plans in place for all three of the sites that you mentioned. Uh, I believe a memo was circulated about the Steve's and Tram to Mayor and Council. There is a sign on the way it's been delayed uh, because of Good. supply chain issues. Uh, we will be working on signage at London Farm as part of the parks redevelopment process Good. that's uh, going to be happening later this year. And as part of the Steveson Museum uh, building improvements, in particular, we're looking at the exterior face of the Japanese Fisherman Benevolent Society building and, and what can be done to better raise awareness of that facility when uh, that entrance on uh, First Avenue is not open. Good. Well, thank you for that. And if you need more money, just nod. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Councilman. I heard you. I heard you. <laughs> yeah, they're going to need we more. We control money. the budget. Okay, I've, got a, I've got a few uh, comments to make, especially for for, for Rebecca. Uh, I spent the whole morning this morning uh, digging up a potato digger that may be uh, good enough to go to the London Farm. Uh, think of it a work to, to repair a few things. So just uh, you know, but something exciting happened in the last couple of weeks regarding the Japanese Benevolent Society building. I have been trying to contact the daughter of the uh, principal of the Japanese language school whose office was in that building mm -hmm. and finally found her last weekend. And we're starting to converse back and forth. She was only about five or six old, old five or six or seven years old when they were uh, sent away. But I'm hoping she'll have some memories that she can share with us. So uh, the building was actually uh, not just the Fisherman's Benevolent Society, but one o it had three offices, one for the Benevolent Society, one for the school principal, and then the back <coughs> was originally a separate building, and it was for the doctor's office and the nurses, and they were combined together in three offices. And I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, Pamiko will have some memories of that, of going, that, going there as a child, to see her father. She may not, but uh, I'm, I've got my, or, or she may have been told stories by her parents. So I'm hoping to have some information from somebody that was, somebody that was there at the time. Anyway, I did want to comment on uh, Michael's comment on the boats and, and it's a different topic than this, but I have the same concerns of the, of the wrapped up boats. And I, I really would like to see us just simply take the rum runner and put it on one carriage inside the shipyard. We don't need two, two operating ways. And the way they have the St. Rock at the Maritime Museum. To restore the Maritime uh, St. The Rock right now, uh, which is totally rotted through and through, would, would cost a million bucks. 
is the same with a run runner. And why not just simply put it in display the way it is and uh, and uh, paint it up and and uh, and we'd have another thing for to tell people about it instead of having it shrink wrapped in the in the uh, somewhere and and uh, not on display. Anyway, that's my comments. Uh, I think the the report is great. Uh, that the the rum runner and those things are an aside and have nothing little to do with the report. But um, since we're talking about those things, I I make those comments. Okay. Anything further from committee? Was someone like move the move? recommendation? Second. Recommendation. All those in favor? Contrary. Carried. And final report is the Sturgeon Bank Eco Walkway. And Jason. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here to answer any questions, and I don't have anything to add to the report. Okay, Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the Chair, I just have uh, two questions. Uh, first one is on our page uh, 53 in the report. Uh, it mentions um, kind of the middle paragraph there, and, uh, and it mentions that uh, any work uh, would require uh, habitat compensation elsewhere if, if it was approved. Um, and so again, just repeat of my earlier comment on habitat compensation. Um, I, I think we need to ensure that we have a way of doing it well before we make a need to do it. Um, so I, and I just haven't seen that in, in, in projects yet. I know there's, there's work being done and, and there's plans elsewhere, um, but I would like to kind of know uh, at this stage what type of habitat compensation elsewhere would we be considering? Would it be like very nearby, uh, or could we target the boardwalk to be in the areas of least um, um, environmental significance, uh, and then you're not covering up anything that needs to be compensated elsewhere? Um, any comments on on that? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair to Councillor Wu. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, similar to any project, habitat compensation will be determined at the time of the detailed design. Uh, right now, the, the uh, design of the boardwalk is, uh, has not commenced it yet. So at that time, we will also work with um, our environmental staff as well as QEP to determine exact location, extent, and type of habitat compensation. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, the sec second question I have, actually I have three, sorry. Second question I have is related to the, in the report, it talks about the Terra Nova Heritage Precinct Plan, a study. Um, and I know that that's not what's on the debate right here. Um, but I also know like with um, the ex exposure to the sun and heat waves and stuff, finding shelter, um, like covered areas as well. Um, and then when I think about uh, a similar boardwalk in a similar kind of area, if you go to, if you've been to Rifle Bird Sanctuary in Delta, um, there's a lot of exposed areas, but also there's some covered areas too where, where people can sit and enjoy the site, but also be out of the sun. So is that part of the precinct uh, plan, like looking into covered space utilization? And I also think it would fit into this walkway that there would be a covered component of it. To the chair, to Councillor Wolf, um, this is exactly why we wanted to. Um, uh, to incorporate this walk, uh, walkways within the Terra Nova Heritage Precinct Plan um, is because we want to look at all considerations as well as aspects in a holistic sense. Uh, as you've mentioned, there are other examples worldwide, uh, not just in the Delta um, site, uh, in terms of walkways, um, bird sanctuaries, etc. Uh, all those will be looked at in terms of examples and precedents, what we can and cannot do, et cetera, with the precinct study. Great. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks. And final question is from, uh, you could turn to the map on page 59. Mm -hmm. just have a couple of questions about that map. Um, so in the, in the bottom corner, uh, the, there's the legend. Um, and for environmental sensitive areas, it, it, it shows that there's no, no color or no pattern. So, does that mean we haven't layered that in yet? And then same goes for the riparian management area, 15 meter buffer below that. And then my other question about that legend, um, that 2271 River Road privately owned, who owns that little uh, patch there? 
be the chair to Councillor Wu. Um, perhaps I'll answer questions from a reverse order based on memory. Uh, the the red uh, outlined area is privately owned, um, and uh, so far we have not done a land search or title search uh, to identify the owner, uh, even though the information should be available. Um, so that's number one. And second is in terms of the um, environmentally sensitive area as well as the RMA, uh, the I think that's really just a, a printing problem with the with the PDF um, or the paper copy that you in front of you. Uh, the environmentally sensitive area uh, should be the light purple area surrounding the shoreline, mm -hmm. and then the RMA 15 meter buffer area should be appearing in light blue uh, or slightly darker purple uh, on your print surrounding the the coastline as well. Great, and I know I can go out to the Richmond um, uh, info, info system, That's correct? And I, I can overlay it to get the better better view of that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, I've got a couple of comments. Uh, the same as Michael on page uh, fifty three. Um, I, I think we've got if if we go ahead with the Terranova Slough, uh, daylighting that to the river, we should bank the. Um, uh, Compensation here, the uh, estuary compensation, because we'd be opening up a tremendous area that would allow us to do a lot of stuff all around Richmond by opening up that that mm -hmm. slough area. And, and any time we wanted more uh, um, a replacement compensation, you just make the slough a little bit longer because uh, it certainly is is what's needed in terms of the chum salmon. And that particular slough was actually a habitat for sturgeon, but we did put gravel in the bottom for spawning salmon, which is required. So we can either have sturgeon or we can have salmon, and uh, certainly that would be compensation for anything we want to do anywhere in Richmond for decades to come. So I think we should consider that as one of the one of the pluses of that project. Uh, the other uh, was on page 52. It mentioned concerns about the boardwalk there. I have more concerns of, of what we did already when we cleared the logs and rotting debris. Now that's part of the natural succession of a marsh is that when logs and debris pile up, uh, on a sea berm, which is, uh, there's one outside half a, a kilometer out from the deck beyond me where all the logs wash up and they rot and it creates a big berm. That's where you've got your voles and your mink and your otters. The mammals would have to live above, wall, above water. And we just simply bulldozed all that away and said we just want it to be marsh. And, and I think we'd uh, be concerned we should never make that mistake again. I think we did more damage to that marsh by clearing those logs than uh, that any boardwalk would even a dream of, of, of uh, causing. In fact, the boardwalk might help to build up that kind of uh, debris uh, uh, in, in the corner of the marsh again so that we can recreate that habitat that we took away. So that's my comments on it. I think it's a great report and I'm really pleased to see it going ahead as part of the, part of the Heritage Precinct study. And uh, I think we're, we're up and away with, uh, with uh, the, the uh, Terranova lands in, in terms of developing a really, really great uh, Area for the for the for the environment and for public uh, education as well. So, any further comments? Some of the recommendation. Can... All those in favor? Contrary, carried. Okay, manager's report. Just two quick ones, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rebecca and Alex. To the chair, uh, this is just to let uh, committee know that there will be a memo coming uh, in the next few days with. Uh, a call out to councillors to participate in the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival. Okay. Alex? I have to make sure I'm not muted. <laughs> uh, good afternoon again. Uh, Richmond Earth Week programming took place this last week from April 16th to the 24th. The city hosted over 23 programs ranging from beekeeping and horticulture to bird watching and harnessing wind power. Over 465 residents attended Earth Week programs across the city. The signature tree plant event at the Garden City Land saw approximately 90 trees and 1,000 shrubs planted by 60 volunteers. Participants that attended the Richmond Earth Week programs included youth, school groups, new residents, seniors, and tourists. Eight community groups supported the city in hosting these programs, including Urban Bounty, 
Richmond Gardening Club, Birds of Canada, the Thompson, East Richmond, and Hamilton Community Associations, the Nature Park Society, and the Richmond Public Library. The celebrations were promoted online and in print form, and the Richmond News independently picked up three of these events. Staff is in the processing, uh, process of gathering photos and more data, and will be sharing the success of this event online throughout the coming weeks. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Anything for any questions from the committee? So we'll let's move. We adjourn. We adjourn. Huh? All those in favor? Contrary, carried. And we'll wait a couple of minutes and let us know when we're all clear for the in-camera meeting. Thanks.